I'm Brodor, and this is Why We Game. Now, my guest today is white trash geek with the guitar, <laughs> you, Mikey Mason. You can't say that anymore. Why? White you trash? Can't, I don't, you, cause it's, nah, uh, fuck it, I'm in. White it, trash. Dude, I'm a... It's I'm, hate speech. No, it's Face, fine. Facebook has flagged it as... Fuck I Literally, off. people talking about my song on Facebook gets flagged as hate speech. That's, that's bullshit. <laughs> How is that possible? Okay, so first of all... You're born and raised Indiana bred, right? Well, I was born in Kentucky, and we moved to Indiana because we figured out that roads let out. So, wow. uh, but I was that, only how five. many generations did that take? Uh, that, no, I was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Neither of my parents are from Kentucky; they moved there. So anyway, but it, my dad was on the run from the police, so it's okay. Uh, it's totally understandable. <laughs> Nobody's going to look in Kentucky. <laughs> I, it's funny. I make, a, I make a similar joke that is less clever. My dad retired with number three, his third wife, to Panama, and people like. Why did you move to Panama? I'm like extradition laws. <laughs> no, but it's a true story. My dad was literally had escaped from prison. <laughs> no, fuck off. I thought you were kidding. Your dad not... escaped from prison? Yeah. Okay, all right. So let's, let's back up. How many, how many one shots have you run at cons about escaping the clink? Zero. You, what the hell, man? It's in your blood. <laughs> I did not. Alright, so your dad right. escaped so, from prison. Alright, so we won't go into why my dad was in prison, but my dad is not a perfect person. We'll just leave it there. But, uh, apparently on my dad's first day or whatever in prison, the guards were telling him that, you know, this this is a story I've been told. It could be total bullshit, but <laughs> that nobody's ever escaped from the, from this facility blah, 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 blah. Well, he was either later that day or later that week, while he was walking back to his cell unattended from lunch, a side door was open and unattended and he walked out, climbed the fence, and did not come back. So someone else's <laughs> sheer neglect or stupidity resulted in your father being hey, the first person to escape from this prison. Nobody's ever escaped from that prison. Hey, yes, that's amazing. So you guys moved to you moved from Kentucky to well, India. How old were well, you? No, we we moved to Kentucky. We were in. Now we were in another history. state yeah, at that yeah. time. We yeah. moved to Kentucky. So how the yeah. fuck was Kentucky an upgrade? I yeah. mean, that, there's like four states you could have moved from. Yeah, because. well, well, it, it was a hiding place, I think. And then, uh, but I was born in Kentucky, so mm -hmm. we moved back there uh, from where we were. And I stayed there until I was five. When I was three, the gunman came and took Daddy away for a while. Mm -hmm. That's when they found him. That's how I refer to it. You know, pink tinted Kodak memories. You know what I mean? Uh, and the gunman comes to the door and takes daddy away for a so, while. Were you a latchkey kid? Uh, well, yeah. Well, my, my mom and dad divorced. You know, she got fed up with this shit and, uh, so when I was eight. But, uh, and then she always either had one or two jobs and they were almost always in the evening. So we were pretty much unattended, my brother and I, for, uh, the majority of our childhood. It's amazing to me the geek experience from sort of the second generation gamers, right? Yeah. So we're middle age, doughy, Caucasian, Midwesterners, right? And it's interesting when people talk about the game industry and its lack of diversity and its lack of inclusivity, people have to understand that it started with fat, reject <laughs> geeks that, you know, I mean, you're an avid reader, for example. Oh, yeah. Escapism was our jam. Yeah. That was the thing is we didn't we didn't like the lives that we had been dealt, so we <laughs> wanted to pretend to be other fucking people. Right? It's true. Yeah, true story. It, yeah, it's it's not a desire to exclude. It was everyone excluded us, and we built our own fucking thing. And it wasn't something insidious. You know, it took me a year and a half of playing D and D before anybody joined our group who would even consider playing a thief. Really? Because of the name thief, nobody wanted to be the thief. Nobody wanted to be the dishonorable one. Seriously, I shit you not. Now that's fantastic. <laughs> it was like a year and a half before somebody said, I wonder what this whole thief thing's about. It's going to be because I'm going to steal this guy's stuff and I'm going to stab him in his fucking back. And, and it, yeah. it wasn't because he was a first level thief and he had 15% max of, I think 20% climb walls was the best you had. 
in uh, <laughs> at that time at first what, level. But... What the hell were people thinking, <laughs> right? When they were trying to do this simulationist style gaming, it's unfun. Right. It's unfun. But anyway, that's <laughs> setting, setting that aside. So let's start with Indiana. So you are in Franklin High School. Yeah. Are you gaming at that time in high school? Uh, well, yes. I lived in Greenwood, which is closer to Indy, when I was in middle school, and that's when we started gaming. Was Shut up. Summer How old were you? I was 10 years old. Summer 1983, and uh, my- Hence the album, Summer yeah, 83. That's- well, everything in that- I have a complicated relationship with parodies. I like them. They're fun. Um, but when I write a parody, I tend to have to try and make it harder for it to be fun- for me because all right a bunch of people are gonna fucking hate me after i say this but it's so easy to write a parody you can do it on accident anytime you fuck up the words to a song you technically just wrote a parody if it's art that you can do on accident where's the bar i raise the bar for me now i'm not saying it's not fun i'm not saying it's not great i'm not saying weird al's not a genius weird al is totally a genius but weird al's a genius not for his parodies but for his pastiches which are song style parodies you want to dare to be stupid is the best uh devo song that they never wrote you know what i mean mark mother's boss said that is the best devo song we never wrote period end of story uh, uh one more minute these are the style parodies that weird al does calling weird al a genius because of his song parodies would be like calling a master painter a master painter for painting gene simmons makeup on a velvet elvis painting i mean both things he didn't design or make up so <laughs> all right uh, so uh but weird al is a genius and it's not that i don't like parodies i love parodies i enjoy them immensely but they're kind of like a moped, fun to ride. I don't like people to watch me doing it. <laughs> no, I get it. <laughs> so when I write a parody, I tend to try and make it harder because I have a problem just enjoying things and being happy. That's because you are a middle-aged, <laughs> Asian Midwesterner. And that is just, it's fucking baked in our goddamn DNA. I've gotten so much better at just letting other people enjoy things, but for me, it's harder. It's so harder for me. I think it was uh, Ryan Friedrich who, who I think credited you for this was uh -oh. not yucking other people's yum. Yeah, well, I didn't make it up, okay. but yeah, I try not to yuck. That's it. You know, do you what? find it difficult? A uh, very difficult. Sometimes, uh, like Twilight, I disdain Twilight. I saw Twilight in the theater, by the way. You, why? Because my oldest son, who was in middle school at the time, all of his friends wanted to see it and so he thought it would be cool like the x-men or whatever and he wanted to go see it and so you know i'm like he's into this so i i tried i checked the book out of the library i tried to read it i couldn't get more than four pages in i was like you know what i had to go audiobook with george rr R. martin i'll go audiobook i tried listening to the audiobook i could not do it i just couldn't do it at all and i'm like all right, I'm biting the pillow. I'm going in dry to the theater, <laughs> and uh, and I'm there with my. No, there's been no lube, no oh, warm up, oh. no gentle rings around. And I already, you know, and I just knew that I didn't. I I did not like the prose. I just didn't like the the style. I figured maybe the the movie treatment. And it turns out that Twilight's just not for me. So Ben comes out of the theater, and we're getting in the car. And he goes, "Dad," and I said, "Yeah," and he goes. That movie wasn't very good, was it? <laughs> I'm like, well, I wasn't going to say anything in case you liked it. <laughs> he goes, no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, I saw it. But Twilight's one of those things where I disdain it, but there are people who, who love it. And so it's hard when it's something that I... You know, I have a degree in creative writing from Ball University. Right? I have a, I have a, I have a bachelor of science uh, hit, hit from Ball State University. I have a BS and BS from BSU. <laughs> so no, that's classic. <laughs> that's great, man. That's what uh, sixty thousand dollars will buy you in a college education. Uh, yeah, be depressed. So creative writing obviously has been a big influence for your music. Oh yeah, but you as a gamer, I assume that that provided you with a platform that a lot of other people don't have when producing fiction for gaming. Oh, sure. I played for a year, and then I became a, a dungeon master, you know, started running games because there were just too many people who wanted a game and not enough people. I wanted a game and didn't have enough friends who were willing to DM. And I'm like, I'll do it. Whatever. Let's do this. It's a great opportunity to stretch your creative muscles, and especially if you're lazy, and you don't want to write the whole story, it's even better. 
but you, know, you would not classify yourself as a lazy person, I presume. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm recovering. I don't really? know. Well, you're Sagittarius, right? I mean, so you're, oh. you're optimistic and you're creative and you're focused and you're half horse, so you've got a huge fucking cock. <laughs> well, you're wrong on all counts. <laughs> okay. I remember we were, we were at a con once and you and I were talking and I was pretty drunk. No. I, I get very emotional when I've been drinking. And, and I said, I said to you, I said, the thing that was remarkable about you specifically out of, uh, out of all the people that I've been talking to is that the tremendous amount of courage it takes to take something, to create it and put it out there is one thing. But you're the product. And that takes a tremendous amount of courage. And I remember saying to you that I don't have that. Well, <laughs> to, to be honest, I didn't launch into it with me being the product, although that that's the truth when people ask me what i sell the the most bare bones answer is i sell me my personality my you know the experience of me being me which fucking why anybody's buying that is <laughs> beyond me but you know i started as a stand up comic and so i was playing a, a a parody a satirical amplified section cross section of my personality with people i knew it was a lens through which i projected a part of me and made it bigger than life. And so that's what stand-up comedy was to me at that time. I was playing a character, uh, which was based both in me and my background and a lot of people I knew, but wasn't me. So I wasn't selling me. I was selling bullshit. Organized, creative, spontaneous seeming bullshit because quality spontaneity takes a lot more prep time than most people think. But it's true. That's why improv actors rehearse, right? <laughs> you, have to, you, have to, you have to exercise the muscle. Quality spontaneity requires a lot more prep than a lot of people think. So, <laughs> cause you know, if they, you don't want to be bad at it. So when I started, it wasn't that. And then when I moved over to doing, you know, I wrote, she don't like firefly. And I went from doing stand up comedy to geek music that, so that was the transition. <laughs> that was it. Right. Well, so what, it what began it? What inspired you to write She Doesn't Like Firefly? All right. So first, stop correcting my grammar. It's <laughs> She Don't Like Firefly. <laughs> Sorry. What, what inspired you to write She Don't Like Firefly? <laughs> Which I watched that, I watched that video. There's no way you're breaking up with that chick for not digging Firefly. There were people who treated that like it was a fucking National Geographic documentary. <laughs> Like, I had this relationship with this perfect, beautiful woman, right? And video recorded it, and then uh, found out she didn't like Firefly, broke up with her, kicked her out, wrote a song, recorded the song, then called her back and had her shoot a video with me. <laughs> People thought it was autobiographical. That's uh, yeah, hilarious. And, 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 like, it's a joke. Nobody's doing this. Yeah. If you're doing this, you are the joke. That's the problem. So, but yeah. Uh, it started a couple of years before that. It started with Fear the Con 2. So as a stand-up comedian, I was on the road filling my days with podcasts, anything. I, I just discovered podcasts. I had a little iPod and I just discovered podcasts. And I realized that because I, I hadn't been able to game for a long time, I was missing that. And I realized there were podcasts about gaming. So I start downloading these actual play podcasts, which I could not stand. I hate listening to other people have a good time when I can't right? join in, right? Yeah. And also, quit making jokes, all right? Don't rattle the ice in your cup. Um, <laughs> like, all the things you take for granted at table, it's just background noise, but on a microphone, it's... It's wretched. Oh. Yeah. And I say that as somebody who has long time done an AP with the Fear of the Boot guys. Right. right. And yeah. so it, it's uh, it's distracting. Some people can deal, and I'm not. You know, I get distracted. So I started looking for podcasts and I can't remember. I started listening to one and I really liked it and then realized it only went six episodes and I was, and I was, I was through those so quick and I was like, what the, f <laughs> right? This has been, uh, done for two, three years and it's still on the air. Six episodes still, still on iTunes or whatever. This is bullshit. And I looked up podcasts. I wanted to find one that was still going and it was Fear the Boot and I started listening to Fear the Boot. It took me maybe a month, month and a half to listen to most of the episodes of Fear the Boot, and I was on the road when I found out that they were having a convention called Fear the Con, and I got excited, and then I realized, looking down, that it was a year prior, almost, and I was like, mother! <laughs> and so then I just started 
fast forward and, you know, going through them just to see if I could get and see if they had another one coming up. And it turned out that they were planning Fear the Con 2 and they were wanting to know if people wanted to do panels about, uh, if, if you had gaming that you, you, if gaming affected your day job in any way, shape or form and you wanted to talk about that at a convention, uh, would you? And so I sent them an email. It was Chad who responded to me. I said, look, I'm a stand-up comic. I'm a professional. I do this for a living. I got my sense of humor around a gaming table and I would love to come to the convention to do it. And it was on. You know, we worked it out. I got to the convention. I did a show at the convention. It was just my regular dick jokes uh, to middle America, geek rock, sorry, white trash, not hate speech, white trash. Uh, totally not hate speech, white trash comedy. Yeah, your neck, your neck is red. Like it, yeah. it's so red that the wall behind you is illuminated. I'm just by, saying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I could fly backwards and light Santa's way. Uh, it's <laughs> you just got to put the corn somewhere else. That magic corn. No. Um. So I did fear the con, and I didn't have any geek material to speak of. It was just my regular stand-up act, uh, which was. Stuff that obviously was informed by geek humor at some point. That I got my sense of humor around a gaming table. So I did it. It was a great time. I went back the next year. I did it. It was a great time. But I just wanted something more. I wanted something. I was like, it would be great if I could sing songs that I care about, that these people care about. And uh, <clears throat> my buddy Ty had lent me the Firefly DVDs, and I finally got around to watching them. And we were in a bar, and we were talking about oh, a friend of ours. And she had broken up with a guy or shut a guy down in a very, very cold way. Like, she was just stone cold about it. And I'm certain he deserved it. But anyway, she just, like, shut him the fuck down. And I said, that was so cold, she didn't even cry when Wash died. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> and Ty went, ooh, right? And so that kind of festered. And I wrote this song, and the original version of the song sounds like Alabama. She don't like Firefly. Didn't even cry when Wash died. <laughs> um, not even kidding. And I was like, this is not right. This is not right. So I'm rewriting the song. I'm trying to, where do I do it? Where do I do it? And I'm at a rest area in West Virginia, the Pyramids one, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and there are people who know what I'm talking about. The Pyramids, I think it's right there on 77. But anyway, uh, maybe it's 64. But I'm walking in because I got to piss real bad. My eye teeth are floating. And I'm walking in to these Pyramids. And it hits me that I need to do it like Nickelback. She don't like Firefly. <laughs> and right, and I immediately bust out singing it because she don't like Firefly, right? And I'm walking in a rest area. There are people looking at me like I'm fucking insane, and I am cackling because I've got it. Right. I, you, you don't understand. I got it. Right. You, you found the magic, and it's so different. you don't you, you you can't go looking for it. You just like, stumble on it. So I went and I did it. It came back, and I wrote the song, and I recorded the song after the trip. I recorded it in one day and called Ty up and we set up the shoot for a couple days later and I did that. That was the week before Fear the Con 4 in 2011 and I posted it online the week before Fear the Con 4 and after about 48 hours it started going viral. So it was Fear the Con 4, the first time I played She Don't Like Firefly Live. If you listen to the end of the Impotent Nerd Rage album, there's a... A uh, little thing at the end called Echoes of Forum X, and it's a nod to Kiss Destroyer, but <clears throat> the rock and roll party track at the end of Destroyer, but it's literally recorded at Fear the Con 4. It's the first time people singing along to She Don't Like Firefly. And I knew as soon as I knew that, I knew I wanted to, and I'm there at the convention doing this geek song, and the rest of it's just my slightly evolving white trash, middle America dick joke humor to music. And I realized that I want, by the time I come back to Fear the Con, I, and I'd been introduced, I hadn't played it yet, but to a game called Kobolds Ate My Baby. And I knew that I wanted to write a song called yeah. Kobolds Ate My yeah, Baby. All Hail King Torg. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. And, uh, and I knew that I wanted to, uh, write a song called Too Fat to Troop about Jack Porkins. <laughs> and, uh. Which is fucking hilarious, by the way. And I knew I wanted to write a song called Me and Alan Moore's Beard and make it like a buddy film kind of thing. And beyond that, I didn't know a whole lot about what I wanted from, but I, I just, those three things I knew I wanted. And, uh, the Fear of the Boot fans and family funded that first album. I mean, they just knocked it out of the park. I went to a studio. Some of it I wrote while I was 
<laughs> waiting to record songs in the studio. So it was, it was an amazing experience. And I, I owe fear the boot like hmm. big time for being able to do what I do for a living because I'd already been able to transition to being a full-time comedian from, you know, being a middle manager and being able to transition from being a comedian full-time, which is a sweet gig. Don't get me wrong. All right. Driving around, drinking before you go to work. You know, you, you walk into work, they hand you a shot. This is a bad job. This is not a bad job. Being able to tell people, fuck you from your desk. Mine had a microphone and it was on a stage, but you know, <laughs> it was a pretty good gig. But being able to do, go from that to play music that I just, whatever music I want to play. When I started, it was, Geek rock comedy because I thought that that's what people wanted. But it, and I, I've talked about I have a podcast that goes out to my patrons on Patreon. Uh, there's free episodes every Friday. It's called Mikey Talks uh, because I'm super original. Uh, <laughs> I'm creative, like like you said, Mike. <laughs> well, I, I just call bull, I just call bullshit on that. I, I do. And in fact, in one of in one of your videos, it was actually because I wanted to talk about this. All right. Um, you you have a, a an endorsement of Guy Gaxian proportion. I do. I really and, do. And during the video of uh, Best Game Ever, you talk about how uh, how you base the song on someone else's song and how she was sweet and charming in real life, mm -hmm. and you are not sweet and charming. And I just I got to call bullshit on the charming part. You're very charming. But again, I was playing a character, and I've I've got to the point I realized, uh, and it was conventions that did this that people who like what I do. Sure, they came to me because there was that – the bug light outside, right? The bug light of geekery, right? So I'm singing songs about Firefly, about Star Wars, about role-playing Right, not role only are you games. a member of the tribe, you right. are a bard. Right. I'm, yeah, I'm a member of the tribe and I'm a bard of somewhat. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm not really good at anything. Nobody really wants me in the party, but I'm there <laughs> and I have a guitar. <laughs> but, I mean, and a frying pan, Wayne. Um, yeah. <laughs> sorry. That's that's a throwback. But yeah, so I realized that they don't care. They just want good music. They want to know that you're genuine. They want to know that you're real. They want to know you're not a dick. And they want good music. And beyond that, they're pretty open to what it is. They're open to genre. They're open to uh, content. They're, they're open to musical style. They're open, whatever. They're fine. You know, I know people who, if I did a hip hop song, they'd eat it up. Well, they'd first pick their jaw up the floor because that's just not me, you know, which is, you know, incentive for me to do it. <laughs> but, but it's not me. I'm not a hip hop fan. But as long as I did it well, unless I was doing it intentionally poorly, which is a different kind of doing it well. But they don't care as much that it's geeky or funny as long as it's good, as long as it's genuine, as long as it's well crafted and well performed and heartfelt. That's what they care about. So what's your touring like now in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic? This is the first performance right here that I've done since March. Well, I feel, ex <laughs> I feel extremely, I feel extremely flattered because one, I just assumed that you did not like me. And, and two, the fact that, that is my default position on it. Every, everybody as well. Oh, fair enough, Here's fair the insecurity. Enough. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Fuck man. It's the goddamn worst. Mm. Did you get beat up as a kid by your parents, by your uh, mom? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, and, and no, I didn't get beat up by my mom, but, uh, I got beat up by my brother. Uh, but you know, he's also the guy who wouldn't let my dad hit me. Yeah, I get it. I get <laughs> you it. My, know? <laughs> my, my older brother, he saved me from some significant beatings that I would have gotten from my mother. Yeah. Like, I mean, just, but anyway, this show ain't about me. It's about you. We can discuss our dysfunctions later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I get the feeling that, that, uh, some people would think that, that our commiseration would amount to a, uh, bad childhood big dick contest. And it, honestly, yeah. well, if you've been in a bad, if you've been in a, a weird abusive childhood, it, uh, you commiserate in weird ways. Yeah. And it would probably be more of us finding more in common than. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, and people be like, because people want to, people want to hear you be, they want to, they want to hear you be funny, and yeah, they, they want to talk about gaming. Right? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, this is the first show that you have it's done it. since March. I was on the road. I had uh, March booked. I was on the road to BFG Con in Frederick, Maryland, when the Ohio governor closed the state, and then I heard that. Uh, where was I going to be? Oh, yeah. And so that meant that the convention I was playing the week after that, not going to happen. 
And on the way, I heard that uh, Kansas City governor – or sorry, Kansas City mayor closed the city or put in the cap. So that meant that uh, the convention I was playing later – uh, wasn't going to happen later and it was supposed to be in June, I think. And then I had crossed over from Ohio into West Virginia. I'd been on the road about five and a half hours when I got the call from the organizer at BFG Con that Maryland had called it. Oh. And it was the day before the convention. It was the day before the convention. So, you know, I'm not crying because the especially small conventions, their organizers are the ones who take the biggest hits. People take all the shit out on them and it's not their fault. And they've got contracts that they've got to try and figure out how to make everybody happy. And so, you know, I turned around, I came home and I was kind of sad about it. And then all of a sudden everything's closed and everything's stopping and and so i've been going stir crazy man i've been going uh i've i spent since i don't know 2000 and i don't know 2006 since march of 2006 uh hundreds of thousands of miles easily 60 70 thousand miles a year just in traveling to do shows hundreds of thousands of miles i'd been on the road most of the time from 2006 until march so do you get 2020. I mean, any gaming? I mean, I know you were saying you got turned on to Fear the Boot because you mm-hmm. were missing gaming. Yeah. No, it how actually... How game on the road? So once I, st- once I started making appearances on Fear the Boot, you know, the whole Boot family kind of opened up to me and I'd be like, uh, I'd be like in Little Rock and, and fans from Little Rock would say, come to the game store. We're going to play Dresden Files. You want to play some Dresden Files? Yeah, I want to play Dresden Files. Or I'd, I'd be up in Minnesota. You want to play some D&D? Yeah, I want to play D&D. <laughs> I'd be in Wisconsin. We're going to play D&D. It's an all dwarf campaign. You want to play an all dwarf? Yeah, I want to play yeah, an all dwarf campaign. So <laughs> shit on elves. I'm in. Yeah. And so we're just, and, and so I got to, and then I started a group at home. I started playing with my kids at home. Um, How many kids you have? I have two. And they're both gamers? Uh, yeah. yeah so my, my Do oldest. Right? Yeah. They don't have a choice. So, so I have a small party. You're in. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, with my oldest and my youngest and, and their friends, and then when uh, when we moved from Red Key to Muncie, Red Key is a really small town, so when we moved to Muncie, I started a gaming group again, like a regular gaming group, and it was just awesome. But it's you're, incredible. So, But the desire to be at the Mikey Mason table, has to be intense because when I worked at a game store, just as a fucking clerk at a game store, right? Like, you know, early twenties, <laughs> not anybody. People were like, Oh, you work at the game store. You must be a great gamer. I want a game with you. Well, that just builds. So you just take over a game store and people are like, Ah, oh, I game with the guy who runs the game store. Yeah. But for Mikey Mason, it's got to be like, I'm at the Mikey Mason table. There's no pressure at all. Uh, that's got to be coveted. Uh, right? yeah, no, not really. Um, <laughs> I mean, most of my friends, the people who play it like, uh. They don't get it. Because uh, you're just Mike. I'm, yeah, that's yeah. me. That's just me. You know, when you, when I'm at home, there are people, this is gonna sound weird and egotistical, but it's true. There are, there are people who listen to my music in Britain. There are people who listen to my music in Denmark, in Germany. There are people who listen to my music in Asia. You've got a huge in Australia, I suspect. Uh, I'm not huge in Australia, but I have a few listeners in Australia. I, you know, in Canada, and, and I'm not saying I have throngs, but I mean there are literally people who listen to my stuff in South America. But at home, I'm just that guy, and they don't, you know, I. I keep telling Jody that I need to move anywhere where I have a fan base because I'd work every weekend right. and I'd make bank every weekend and I'd just, I could just go play anything. Just any bar at a, pl- a town where I had a fan base would pay me $400 a night to come in and play because I'd pack the damn bar every night. Uh, if I had a fan base there and they're, you know where they're not? Muncie, Indiana. That's where they're. <laughs> but you're comfortable being a Midwesterner. Uh, my wife is not leaving. Muncie, Indiana. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Well, she might leave Muncie, but she's, uh, she's, her family is in Indiana. Sure. And, uh, she loves her family. I've met them. I don't know what she sees in them. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love my mother in law. Yeah. I adore my mother in law. Best gift giver I know. Right? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I used to, I mean, my mom's a proper cunt. 
And my mother-in-law is one of my favorite people. Like, I joke that I married the wrong fan mirror. That's how much I love <laughs> my mother-in-law. She's a, she's a goddamn saint. And my he, mother-in-law gives me instruments that I didn't know I wanted. Turn up, like, well, she always gives me whiskey. Winner. And, uh, <laughs> but then, uh, I, I open this, it's this weird box and I'm like, what the fuck is in this for Christmas? And I open it up, it's a ukulele. In my head, the first thing through my head was, what the fuck do I want with a ukulele? And, uh, but I have a friend who makes a living with it. He's in Bermuda. So I sent him a message and said, uh, you got any quick tips on learning how to play a ukulele? He said, it's a guitar, capo at four and ignore the top two strings. <laughs> and all of a sudden I'm playing a ukulele because I can play a guitar. <laughs> okay. I'm not musically inclined. So what was the advice? How does that work? A ukulele uh, is a guitar. Right. It's, uh, it's just tiny and ugly. Yeah. It's the DGBE strings, right? Okay. Uh, of a guitar, except capoed at four. So it's EGCA. But why ignore the top two strings? Because they're non-existent on a ukulele. Oh, okay. All right. So so they're not even there, right? Okay. So as soon as I do that, I'm like, I'm figuring out how to play my songs on a ukulele. And it took me less than five minutes where I looked at Jody and said, I need a bigger one. (laughs) (laughs) And I have a bigger one now. But um, (laughs) but I need it better. (laughs) Well, no, no. It was a soprano. And I've got these... You know, I'm so, a mid- I got Midwestern, Midwestern fingers. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I have the same fingers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, so as long as it's a, you know, I can put one finger down on it, it's great. But once I have to get more than a finger on the fretboard on a soprano, it's not that easy. But it was fun, and so I ended up with a, I, I got myself a, a concert uke, and it's much better, size wise, for me. I haven't yet splurged and got the Bozuki, which is the uh, guitar sized ukulele. It has the same pitch. It makes the same sound. Well, it's with metal strings. It doesn't... No, it's a guitar-sized ukulele with metal strings. I got So it's... it's, I don't know why they make them, but I want one. (laughs) And uh, just because... Just because it doesn't make sense doesn't mean you don't want it. And... (laughs) Right? Right. No, I got it. (laughs) I mean, I have a 30-sided die. Anyway... (laughs) It's for Dungeon Crawl Classics. Yeah. No, I got you. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, she, she gave me a mandolins. Like, I had no desire to play a mandolin. All of a sudden, I'm writing mandolin songs. That's what, uh, that's where Oliver Reed, the song Oliver Reed came out of that. Hmm. Uh, Dibbler's Lament came out of me just dicking around on this, uh, mandolin. No, I love my mom. My right. mother-in-law. So what is your performance schedule like then in the time of methadone? I like to call online conventions methadone. <laughs> okay. Because heroin's the real deal, right? And right now all we have is methadone. <laughs> um, it's, I've pulled back. Everybody wants me to do an online show. And uh, I'm not doing a Gen Con show. At all? Nope. Maybe I'm wrong. I went through the catalog, and I thought I found. I thought when you, I did, you did left, find me. I'll be in, in yeah. the comedy cabaret. Yeah, uh, but uh, that was pre-recorded. I pre-recorded my segment and sent it to Mark Gunn, who's a, a dear friend of mine. But I did not submit any, and it's because I realized that it, it just doesn't do anything for me. My online presence is my online presence, and I do a free online show every month. My next one is August seventh, so okay. it'll be tonight, uh, August seventh. <laughs> Uh, 2020 at twitch.tv slash comedy rock geek. It's a free show from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I do one a month. Tips are accepted. I, I do requests in exchange for a certain tip level. At a smaller tip level, you get a recording of the entire show. An even smaller one, you won't get a recording of the show, but I'll spin what's called the Wheel of Mikey and pick a random so it, literally picks a random song from my catalog and I play that song for you. I do toasts of epic proportion uh, where, you know, you tip me a certain amount and then I will do a long rambling bullshit toast about you (laughs) and drink. And I end up pretty drunk by the end of the show because people love me and they like me to get drunk and, and shoot off at the mouth. So that'll be August 7th and I'm doing those anyway. And the people who are going to support me are already going to be there. And all it does doing online conventions is divide the income. I'm literally keeping a convention. Some of them are smaller conventions that I feel like need the support of artists. And the others are conventions that I play like Dragon Con or Gen Con, not only because I love the convention because I do, but there is a significant advantage to playing that convention. You expose yourself to a new fan base and there are lots of new people and that's great, but they're just not going to find me. I'm not going to find one new fan, I don't think, playing Gen Con online. Not yeah. one. Zero. I'll find zero. I'm assuming then that going out, being in public, 
pressing the flesh, being present at events is your best marketing opportunity. When you're selling yourself, that's what you have to do. Yeah, and then and that's why when I drove up here today and I got in my hotel room and I was super depressed and I didn't do anything last night, I just sat there and vegged out on TV because there's just I, the city's empty. Yeah, and it broke my heart. <laughs> If I'd have known you were coming in early, I would have called him, had him open it. Yeah, you know, right? I mean, that would have been, that would have been nice. Like, like, shit, Brodor's coming. We somebody put the window it. back in the ram. We need to get 70,000 <laughs> tribe members into Indianapolis stacked. Please, please put uh, the window back in the ram. Look, right. I know some people. So, all right, well, let's, well, I want to backtrack. First of all, I want right. to go back to the Gygaxian endorsement. All right. So Gary Gygax's daughter mm-hmm. um, basically gushed on you and said that Gary would have loved your stuff. I'm paraphrasing. But how did that come about? The I believe it was the fourth anniversary of Gary's death. Somebody posted my song on her wall. And she watched it and she had her mom watch it, Gary's ex-wife. And they both wrote me. They sent me emails and I said, first off, this is my, my little geek fanboy heart is going nuts right now. And just knowing that you like my song, that you think Gary would have liked the song, that's, that should be enough. But, uh, do you mind if I post this on my website? And they said, sure. So I did. The only thing better would be to be contacted by the Tolkien estate <sighs> and be like, uh, yeah, Mr. Mason, we just got to tell you that JR, he would have loved this shit. <laughs> Kind of better than that would have been like, you know, Christopher saying, uh, so I transcribed it into, to Sildaran and now it's going to be printed in the back of the Silmarillion. <laughs> that would be, <laughs> all right, but this is bullshit fantasy land. So yeah, that's a, that's a, happen. that's a bridge uh, way, way too far. So, <laughs> so you're middle school, you get into gaming, you're 10 years old, you get into gaming, you're doing bullshit D and D. Uh, and everybody thinks it's satanic. This is literally in the middle of the satanic panic. Right. It's 1983 is when I started playing. And my mom realized – I make jokes about my mom not liking Dungeons & Dragons, but she loved Dungeons & Dragons because she knew that instead of being out on the streets, getting drunk, having sex, doing drugs, getting in trouble, her kids were sitting at the kitchen table drinking tea – Rolling dice, doing math, reading books, <laughs> practicing problem solving. She was like, this is the best game ever, right? <laughs> that, that's where I'm at is, you know, everybody thinks we're Satanists because we read. How weird is that? So <laughs> that's actually, that's a disturbing time too, because I mean, I very distinctly remember that being a kid and intellect being something that was shamed. I don't oh, know yeah. if that's still the case today. I don't have kids, but. Right. And well, and, and, you know, a lot of people, well, I don't know, uh, one of the tendencies of my generation, and it's a tendency that, that I have had to force myself to overcome is to belittle or poo poo geek culture because it's become popular culture now. And the reality is, yeah, we had to fight for it. And yeah, we got picked on for it. And yeah, this is the utopia we envisioned. So why don't you just shut up and enjoy it instead of belittling the people who didn't have to get picked on for it? You know, my youngest to his middle school years, uh, two, two years in middle school, well, a year in middle school and a year in high school wore his rainbow dash hoodie. My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, with a fucking mane and horse ears on it. I was worried he was going to get picked on, and the kids, I mean, I'm sure he did get picked on a little bit, but for the most part, kids were very accepting that he was a brony, and he loved Rainbow Dash, and it was okay. That would have never flown in my middle school and my high school. Never would have flown. So what was your first deviation from D&D? Uh, ooh... Gamma World, okay. and then Marvel Superheroes. Uh, how I've never played that. How, but that's Phaser the Rip. diceless one, right? No, no, it's okay. it's all percentile all dice. Uh, okay, I'm thinking of a later iteration. Had to be yeah. Marvel. Gotcha. So then, so you're playing TSR's Gamma World. You TSR's Marvel Super. It was all TSR, right? Uh, and that's all high school stuff. Uh, no, it was middle school. Middle and, school, and then chill. Uh, which was TSR's version of Call of Cthulhu. Oh, uh, <laughs> I doubt I don't remember. We were up TSR's ass for a little bit. And then uh, we mo- once we moved on to high school, I mean, there were other games that were in that era. We played a little bit of James Bond 007. We played uh, a little bit of, I mean, we had a lot. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other strangeness. Uh, 
Kevin Ciambietta and Eric Wojcik, I think is how you pronounce it. Villains Vigilantes was a big one. Jeff D's Vigil- Villains Vigilantes. That's oh, so a hero uh, system game, right? Yeah. Yeah, old buckets of Jesus. With that game, you gotta be super smart to play that. You gotta pretend at least. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not my, it's, it's not a my lot game. of math. Yeah, and it's uh, too many. Too many. So did you ever get into board gaming, miniature gaming, or has it always been specific? We couldn't afford miniatures. When I say I was born and raised in a trailer, I mean, when I was born, my parents lived in a trailer most of my life till I was 17 years old. I lived in a trailer or in a rented apartment, but for the most part, it was a trailer. We couldn't afford miniatures, so we didn't play miniatures games. Theater of the Mind, that was great. We got basic and, and uh, expert set Dungeons and Dragons because my brother was mowing lawns and uh, had the money to buy – one of them was on sale for half off and the other one was full price. And he had the money to buy both of them if they were half off. So he found uh, – he switched some stickers around and ended up getting them both for half price. Oh, interesting <laughs> enough. So I, in Sorry, it, Toys R Us. Oh, uh, so uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> right. Because a lot of my D&D collection as a kid came from shoplifting. Um, because we weren't well to do. I mean, I'm, I mean, if I look back at my childhood compared to many other people, it was, it was fine. It was a cakewalk, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, we didn't have the money to buy D&D stuff. And I certainly, my parents, my mom's, my dad, anyway, we didn't have the money to buy D&D stuff. And so we just fire ripped it off. <laughs> it's terrible, but that's what we did. That's and it's wrong and I'm ashamed of it, but yeah. So you had Toys R Us is where you got your D&D stuff? That's where he got it. That's where we started. Did it. you have we a game store, store in your town? Not really, no. Oh. Uh, then there was Tom Metzler Toy and Hobby that I got some of the stuff. Like I, I started getting into GURPS, which I loved the system, but nobody ever really played it with me. And then as I, you know, as I moved up into high school, we played Platinum Fantasy Role Playing and Rifts and a whole bunch of different stuff. I loved the, the setting for Rifts and hated the system. I hated the system. But yeah, that's, I mean, that's, you know, I, I would play anything somebody wanted to play. Let's do it, you know. Do you have preferences? Do you have game styles or genres that you really would prefer to play over others? I like, oh, I like the idea of story stick games. Narrative, Tyson, narrative above the Very mechanic. narrative, yeah. yeah. I like the idea, The but for most gamers that I know, most gamers that I play with, that is too abstract for them and they just – even those that I know that are theater majors and you should be great at this. And they're like, I want you to tell me that I need to roll this on this die and then I succeed or I fail. That's what I need. I, I don't want to have to try and figure out through verbal geometry how to affect a roll. To them, it feels like bullshit. And to me, that's you know home base. <laughs> but I love the idea but I've never really uh, had the execution – of it. And I love the Powered by the Apocalypse games. Again, for certain groups, it's just too abstract. What I have found works for my group, Savage Worlds works. They really like it gives them the proper combination of flexibility, but also this is what you gotta roll. They like that. We loved fifth edition. Right now we're playing Dungeon Crawl Classics because I did a gig for Goodman Games and had they said uh do you want us to pay anything? I said, ah, send me a game book or something. So they sent me a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I read it and I went nuts. Why? Because Why? What? I mean, is it, is it because it's like this OSR wank or? It's not an OSR wank. I mean, and, and a lot of people think they, I mean, really. A I've lot never of, played. A so. lot of people call it a retro clone. But here's what it clones. That feeling that you had when you first played D&D when everything was new and magic and dangerous and you didn't know that you had to set green slime on fire and you didn't know that different colored dragons had different color breath weapons and you didn't know that kobolds weren't deadly and you didn't know what everything else is that's what dcc clones the rule system's not a clone it's so not a clone what mechanic does it use i mean it uses a uh, well a standard d20 right it uses the action die mechanic which for most most players is a d20, but for halflings is a d16. 
and it can go up as your character goes up. <laughs> so you can get up to a D30. That's and, ridiculous. And it's got all, and that's the other thing is it's got all these dice that you, it's got, you got to roll a D3 or a D5 or a D7 or a D14 or a D16. And you're like, why does anybody need those dice? And I'm going to say, why do you need a fucking D12? Because they're cool. That's why. <laughs> Pick up your dodecahedron and roll, my brother. <laughs> but the biggest thing is the magic system. And this is something they, they have a thing in there called mercurial magic. The crit tables are nuts and your crits depend on your level and your class. And then also your fumbles. So if I'm a 10th level fighter, my crit is different than my seventh level wizard. Oh, so much so. <laughs> if you're, if you're first, uh, they only go to 10. The levels only go to 10. So it's basically take fifth edition and have it in levels. Okay. So a first level character in DCC is as good as a second almost a third level character in fifth edition is a, is that strong right but yeah no no you can have a your we'll just say that a 10th level fighters critical is going to be more than likely much much more effective against anything than a zero level character's critical or a first level character's critical it's just that – and then the magic system, they have this thing called Mercurial Magic where every spell you get as a as a wizard or a magic user has uh, a uh, – there's an 80 percent – was it 80 percent? Yeah, I think it's an 80 percent chance of an unintended effect and it's forever. So like there's this possibility that when you cast Magic Missile that you're going to take damage every time. <laughs> Like every time you cast magic missile, you take one to three damage. There's, a, there's this blowback or feedback. Right? Yeah, uh-huh. and, and there are different. Or uh, I have a character right now. And I don't have it. It's one of the characters in the game. Every time he casts flaming hands, he gets a psychic shield for one d four rounds. That raises his armor class by two. I have one that every ca- time he casts something, he turns his skin on a flesh. He turns into basically it all turns invisible, but you can see his skeleton. There is one mercurial effect where you cast a spell and the nearest living thing to you dies. So you can have that. It can be read magic, right? And you find these out by casting the spells for the first time. And it's the same effect. So you can have a wizard, right, <laughs> who has this. And, and I've heard about this uh, through the Dungeon Crawl Classics, through the uh, the Spellburn podcast, where I've heard about where this wizard will carry a bag of bugs just on his belt so he can cast a spell that causes the nearest creature to him to die and not kill his party members. Yeah. But then that they would get into combat and he would throw the bag of bugs on the ground, run into the middle of everybody and re- and cast read magic. Yeah, <laughs> He'd be like, fun. He'd grab somebody yeah. and cast read magic yeah. and then die. <laughs> <laughs> he like hugs them. Read magic. <laughs> Ridiculous. So, and there's, there are so many, and then there are patrons, and the spell system, as Spellburn Podcast describes it, is more Vancean than Vancean. So you take that original D&D uh, Vancean spell system. Just because you cast a spell doesn't mean you lose it. If you try cast the spell, you have to make a roll. If you fail the roll, you've lost the spell. If you if you fumble the roll, you may suffer some sort of corruption from the spell, like you may grow a beak. <laughs> Yes! That's cr- so and and <laughs> and if you want to add to your role, you can do what's called spell burn, which is mean you can hurt yourself. You can take off points of your strength, agility, or constitution, or all three. Now that's brilliant. Alright? That's brilliant. And you have a stat called luck that you can use after you roll anything to affect the roll and once you burn luck it's permanent you'll get back your strength agility and constitution at a rate of one per day one point not one per per step but one point per right. day so if i burn that if you I don't burn spell those burn. three stats i wake up tomorrow i get one point in one stat back period right as long as you don't spell burn that day you have to go a complete day without spell burning but if you spell burn 20 points worth of stats it counts as a natural 20 but yeah. that means that you got afforded because you rolled a natural 20 and you add the 20 that you spell burned to the roll. So that's 40, which means you've got the best effect. And each spell has a list of effects that range from failure or, or corruption to nearly godlike proportions. Like you've sanctified the entire friggin' earth with your holy sanctuary, which is not the 30 to 32 plus. But anyway, 
It's so fantastic. I mean, I just, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the effort that must have gone in to make this thing. The magic system is the most expansive part of the book. Literally, it's a huge book. And it comes with three ribbon bookmarks built into the book. Ribbon bookmarks that are bound into the binding of the book, so you can always have a bookmark when you need it as a game master. All right, well, How we're... fucking awesome All is right, well, this? Well, you've, you've, you've sold one <laughs> copy of this, uh, one copy of this book already on this episode. Plus, uh, what well, the Goodman? I forget, I forget his uh, first. He's the nicest, Joe, Joseph like, Goodman. He's yeah. the nicest fucking guy, and he's putting forth a lot of effort to preserve the history of the hobby. But I came on a little strong to him when we met the first time, so yeah. he's a bit apprehensive to talk to <laughs> I me. can't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> what? But, but so, and then the, the biggest advice he gives, I know I'm I'm wanking off about No, DCC. it's great. It's great because you lit up. It's make make monsters mysterious again. Your characters don't need to know everything about the monsters. And they have this list in the book that says, here are ways, like, there are tables you can roll to make your undead different. <laughs> like, I mean, seriously. Now, see, that's the, that's the Mikey Mason presidential 2024 run bumper stick. Make monsters mysterious. There is not. You need to put that on your website. There's not a standard dragon in Dungeon Crawl Classics. You have to roll each one randomly, which means if you see a red dragon, you don't know what breath weapon it has. That's fucking scary. Yeah. Think about it. That's scary. Yeah, to to bring the wonderment back, because the best gamers that I've ever gamed with have been adults that didn't grow up gaming. Yeah. Because they sit down at the table, they're, they're friends, they're like, this is a really cool idea. They have no expectations, they have no prejudices, it's amazing. And so... That's what they clone. Yeah. You know, a lot of people call it a retro clone, but that's really what they clone, is the sense of wonder. And it, not in a rules way, I mean, they've kind of codified it a little bit into the rules, but, I mean, man, you know, I thought for years and years that I would never get the experience of enjoying a game like that firsthand again for the first time, right? And I thought the best I would ever get, and it's pretty close, was introducing my sons and watching them light up each time they discovered something new about the game. Or, oh, a mimic? Oh, you're fucked. And because you're first level. <laughs> and whose dad's going to put a mimic in a room with a first level kid? Okay, so... <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But DCC's a meat grinder, right? It yeah. starts with a thing called the funnel. And everybody at the table who's a player, is supposed to roll multiple zero-level characters, three or four zero-level characters. And they suggest that you roll them straight down the line, roll your stats straight down the line. You know what I mean? Strength, agility, constitution, <laughs> you know, uh, personality. It's not wisdom. It's personality, intelligence, and luck. All right? And they want you to roll your 3d6, no modifiers, no roll four, drop oh. one. Just roll 3d6 straight down the line. Six times, write that shit down, and it's super fast to roll a character, right? And then you roll a background, so you can end up a gong farmer, which is literally the guy who empties the, the shit out of an outhouse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have a, a, a bag of night soil as equipment and a night trowel. Soil. <laughs> <laughs> and a trowel, right? And the trowel is it's, just, it's a trowel that's used to scrape. Oh, first thing I'm doing is sharpening that. I'm finding a stone. And it's no, it says it could be dagger. used as a dagger. <laughs> it says in the thing it's used as one d four damage. It's a dagger. <laughs> so, uh, or you could be, a, you know, an alchemist or a slave, an escape slave, or whatever. Well, shit, there's a podcast right there. Is that you just get people who've never played this? Yeah, and you sit down and do well, it. And then they do a first level adventure, which is called, or not a first level. They do a zero level adventure, which is called a funnel. And most of them are going to die. But the ones who don't, you end up with kind of a bond with. And players will try and make it to where, well, I like this one's stats better. This is the one I'm going to try and get. And that that one will more than likely die. And you're going to end up with, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I have uh, one of the players in my group gave them all joke names because he didn't want to take them seriously because he didn't want to get attached because he didn't want to be disappointed when they died. So we had an alchemist named Al and a slave girl named Lola. And Al and Lola both lived. <laughs> and now he has a wizard named Al and a warrior named Lola. <laughs> Do you maintain multiple characters through the course of the game? Uh, I told, well, cause I only have four players in my group. Right. I told them to, you know, keep them. And then if they get down to one character, we'll keep that. But they're each playing two characters right now. Cause we only had one, two, three, four, five who survived the funnel. 
Did anybody <laughs> lose all their characters? Yeah. So how, what do you do then? You there are the... places in most funnels where you could, cause what I did was I had a stack of zero level characters that I'd created. We killed 16 characters, 17 <laughs> characters in that funnel. And literally, 17, 18, I don't know, a lot of characters. There were a lot of characters dead. But most of the funnels have a place designed to where if somebody has lost all their characters, they can, a couple of more can join in here because they were kept in this prisoner cage and they were from wherever, you know, whatever, and they're zero level. And they'll so have- is the funnel a thing that is the same every campaign? Or do you... No, create- no, they, first off, I, they have one published in the rule book. Oh. Portal Under the Stars, but then they publish different zero level adventures for DCC. Mm-hmm. So you can literally go buy a zero level, or, or you can make your own. Well, I got I to gotta tell you, I've never run a module in my life, and this conversation has inspired me to do, to get the book, to get Keep on the Borderlands DCC, mm. and then get mics out and record when we well, can get together. <laughs> you're going to have to run a funnel before you right. do that Keep on the Borderland. The small thing that doesn't quite click with me and I've been realizing it is I am not a module guy either. I've never been a module guy. And so most of it is uh, they, the game is set up to be episodic. It's not set up necessarily for campaigns. You can use it. I mean, it's a rule system. You can use it, have your fun the way you want. They, you know, they're upfront about that and they're very upfront about, we realize that the character creation system that we outlined here is probably going to be the first thing you change about this game, but we suggest that you give it a try. Do it this way. Run a funnel. Just do it once. If you still don't think it's for you, we get it. But before you just reject 3D6 straight down the line, out of hand, four characters per person, run them through a funnel, try it. <laughs> because oh, – Oh, no. You've talked me into it. Sure, sure. I mean just and, – and that's the thing about calling back to earlier in the episode. Yeah. Your profession is selling you, right? Mm. But in the game profession, how you feel about the game, yeah. telling me about it is so important. Right. Absolutely. So, I mean, if you were in a game store, I mean, if I, could, if I had DCC in my buyer from you right now, because that passion, that excitement, that love. And know, I wouldn't do it. It's sincere. You know what it took for me to, I, I, somebody had to, and literally, this is important. If you have DCC and you have friends who aren't into it, let them read the book. Just let them read the book. Lend them this book and let them read it. Period. It's like a, be the library in their life that introduces them to their favorite author. Maybe not their favorite author, but I had as much fun reading the book. There aren't a whole lot of game manuals that you just have a good time reading, but I'm reading this and imagining the possibilities and then seeing how it plays out at a gaming table. And it's just, it's so, you know, I did not read every spell entry, but every now and then I'll pick up the book and I'll flip through the spells and I'll, I read all the mercurial magic effects. I know that you can, uh, whenever, every time you cast one spell, you have a dream that night, you're visited by the shaman of a distant planet and you killed X many thousand people on his planet and he's pleading for you not to cast the spell again. That's metal as fuck. Especially if it's like, Fireball. Yeah, well, anything. I mean, no, 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 no. Let's just detect magic. Uh, <laughs> you killed 72,000 people on my home planet. Please yeah, never cast this. No, yeah, 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 but it might be a magic dagger. Yeah, like, I can live without, you're right. I can live without Fireball, but I can't play D&D without detect magic. Right. Uh, so I, I have uh, two final questions. All right, I'm you. sorry. I apologize. Uh, no, no, no. no t- that, that was wonderful. Why kiss... Kiss is arguably the worst band in the history of ever. Who's your favorite band? I well, Rush. Oh my god, this is about to come to blows. <laughs> this is about this interview is about to come I, to blows. I by all rights should love Rush. Yeah. Musically, technically, virtuosic. Musically, oh. they're virtuosic. Uh, Alex Lifeson is argu- was arguably the least talented member of the group, and he's a badass and smart enough to play tastefully when confronted with Neil Peart, who has like 40 arms. He's an octopus playing, was an octopus yeah. playing the drums. And Getty Lee, who's like, here are 140 notes and I'm playing on the bass. Play keyboard I'm playing bass. Yeah, I'm playing, time, yeah, I'm playing keyboard with my testicles, <laughs> and I need that because occasionally I have to pinch them to hit this note, and they just never grab me. Wow. They just never Never grab me. That doesn't mean I don't respect like, them. When, when I was a kid, when I was in college, I had a friend who turned me on to Heinlein. Yeah. And he said, the Heinlein is gospel. That's what I tell people that Rush is. Rush is gospel. Kiss, I was exposed to them when I was five years old, and they were fucking fire-breathing, blood-spitting superheroes with rock music. Yeah, well, what's amazing about them is I hate their music. I mean, I hate it. However, 
as far as performers, presenters, marketers. I think you've listened to the wrong album. Absolutely brilliant. There's a Kiss album for you somewhere uh, because they went through so many different phases. (laughs) phases. <laughs> I mean, there's disco kiss, there's sugar pop 80s kiss, there's there's metal kiss, there's metal-ish kiss, there's we think we read the Hobbit kiss, there's... <laughs> Shut up, they <laughs> yeah. do not have... It's called Music from the Elder. Oh, oh it was wow. a concept album. Right. I mean, Rush has a song called Rivendell. Right. Yeah. Well, just, it was, it's not that big. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Ezrin produced it. Lou Reed co-wrote some of the songs on it. Shut up. Yeah, I'm not fucking with you, man. Wow. Uh, so there's a Kiss album for everybody, usually, right? If what you like is soul and R&B, uh, do you like soul and R&B? Listen to Peter Chris's 1978 solo album from Kiss. You won't recognize it as Kiss. Ever, period, end of story. If you, if you can listen to that and say, this is Kiss, he's got a song, that's the kind of sugar papa likes <laughs> when you do it, it drives me. And I love this out. I love it all because I was, I'm a, I'm a recovering addict. Now, before, because talking about fandom, I, I, I want to say this because you asked me, uh, about my touring and I start a trip tomorrow. Uh, because not so touring this has been, you leads off. Yeah. You're, wow. Okay. By All the right. time this airs, I'll have been been back for most of a week, unless something horribly happens. In which case, this is my epitaph. That's the kind of sugar Papa likes. Will be the capstone of my musical career. But I've been going nuts, and so that's metaphorically. But being at home, stuck at home, and not being able to perform live, and not being on the road after being on the road for 14 years straight has not been good for my mental or emotional health. Flat out. Not. And my partner, Jody, my wife, knows this, and we talked about it. And so we decided that what I need to do is go somewhere with a specific goal. And I did an EP of songs about Neil Gaiman's American Gods called Storm Coming. And it's my favorite book. And I traveled to a lot of the locations in in the book and wrote songs like, I went to the House on the Rock. I wrote a song called Carousel, about the world's largest carousel. I went to Sea Rock City in Chattanooga. Once I came within 30 miles of the geographic center of the contiguous United States in Lebanon, Kansas. And, but it was the middle of the night, and I was driving back from, from – I had been 17 days on the road. I was driving back from the West Coast, a uh, solo trip, and I had been driving most of the trip. 17 days driving most of the day every day and I was just too tired and didn't and I've always regretted it so I posted a video on Facebook and said this is the deal and this is how much it's going to cost $500 in lodging and gas that's not food that's not anything else I just want to go to the geographic center of the contiguous United States in Lebanon Kansas to see the place that I missed and I'm going to write one more song for this storm coming EP and so I'm going to write a song I'm leaving tomorrow people have been throwing money at me you know, as much as they can. Nobody's throwing hundreds of thousands of dollars at me, but they're funding this and it's because they care about me and they care about the music. And, you know, when you sell what you sell as yourself, people get invested in you as a person and they want me to be well. They want me to be emotionally and, and mentally well. And they also want the music. They want both. They want it all. And they want the stories. If, you know, just in case there are stories, they want pictures. Uh, you know, they want to experience it with me and I want to give it to them. I'm, I'm super excited that I'm going to be driving a dumb amount of hours to go see a plaque, <laughs> you know, come on. <laughs> so Mikey Mason, if, uh, if people want to throw money at you, yeah. Where do they find, I mean, at MikeyMason.com? Go to, yeah, uh, Patreon.com slash Mikey Mason. A lot of people have qualms about Patreon, but really it is financially what's keeping my career afloat right now. Uh, now I do, a, I put out a, a new song every Monday, 52 songs a year. If you pledge at a dollar a month, you get all of those. That's $12 a year, 52 songs a year. Some of them are cover songs. Sometimes I go, like the last, this week I put out a cover of the, uh, of Squeeze's Pulling Muscles from the Shell. At one point, a couple months ago, I covered the Paw Patrol theme song. <laughs> I have a song called Wisdom of Hounds and it starts off like a punk rock version. You think you're about to hear that. You know, How about the song about the dogs? Yeah. And, and you rub my belly and it starts in Paw Patrol, Paw Patrol. <laughs> Uh, I did my song, Rain- uh, Drunkards and Philosophers, that leads straight into Rainbow Connection. But most of it are new songs. So it's mostly brand new music. And you've got, you, I mean, you have 
what, 24 albums? <laughs> That's Kiss. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I was on your website and I counted all of these, I counted all these EP cover arts. Yeah, well, not, and not all the I got. Some then of I go to a different page on your website and there's like a dozen of them. Yeah, so there are, there are 10 full length albums and four EPs and then a what lot of the singles. Distinction? Length. Uh, an EP is what would be, uh, these are left over from the days where vinyl albums meant something. So it's literally how long the vinyl album is. It's how many songs run. Oh, okay. Um, I learned something new today. An EP would have, um, roughly five or six songs on it, but an album, uh, would have probably nine or at nine or ten minimum. You know, Rush could have an album that's two songs because they did 2112 but um <laughs> and, it would be, and it would be forever and it would be, and it's if it's a, it's a would, four four album yeah. set of two that, songs not that i can sing but if you'd like me to go through <laughs> from side a song one and i mean i'll 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 fucking i'll take you on a train to bangkok <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and, stay away from the trees. Yeah. And, uh, uh, oh. So, if we're, uh, so if we want to follow, so if, pretty much if I want to follow your schedule, if I want to get your music, patreon.com slash Mikey Mason, I do a podcast called Mikey Talks. Um, if you back me at $5, you get two more episodes a week. I put out, it's New Music Monday, and then Wednesday and Thursday, I put out episodes of Mikey Talks. On Wednesdays, I do song focuses, so I talk about the writing and the meanings and stories about specific songs. And then um, Thursdays are Tales from the Road. So today's episode just went out, and I told the story of uh, Chuck's Place, which is in Drummond Island, Michigan. But the, how, how do you get to Drummond Island? You drive to Canada, but before you get there, you turn right and... <laughs> And then you have to get on a boat when you run out of land, and then you're at Chuck's place. <laughs> and uh, that's how you get that. But that was a place I had to play. I didn't have to, but I did, and I was happy to play it. But, uh, you know, I tell that story, and sometimes they're very meaningful, and sometimes they're just light and, and fun. And then on Friday, I have free episodes. They're on soundcloud.com slash Mikey Talks and also on patreon.com slash Mikey Mason. Uh, and those are available to the public. So tomorrow there will be a free episode, and those are on more generalized topics. Mikey Mason, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming out. Thanks I for having really, me, man. I really, really appreciate it. Gave me an excuse to get out of the house. Ah, let's go to the Ram. Wiley Game is a production of the Influence Foundation. All rights reserved. Audio editing by Brodor. Music by Owen Godwin.